Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. So yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Desi Grudinarova and I'm a senior policy advisor at Historic England and also historic environment lead at the National Academy for Social Prescribing, NASP. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak today and share with you some of the work that myself and Linda Moncton, uh, head of wellbeing strategy at Historic England, have been uh, leading on in the last couple of years. Um, it's all around embedding well-being in our core work as heritage professionals and specifically um, how this could be applied to a whole organizational approach and designing projects with intent uh, where well-being is a purposefully chosen objective, delivery mechanism and an outcome. We believe that this is uh, completely applicable to uh, archaeology as well and the fact that there are so many examples already um, of many archaeological organizations and colleagues uh, piloting work like this is a proof that uh, this is working and uh, is the way to go. Um, also, apologies for having me today <clears throat> rather than my boss, Dr. Linda Moncton, who unfortunately is not so well at the moment, so she couldn't be here. But um, I will do my best to take you through uh, some main points of our work as I outlined before. So here we go. Historic England have been uh, developing for some time our first well-being and heritage strategy, which uh, aims to help everyone enjoy the well-being benefits of engaging with heritage. We know that uh, our work has significant impact and reach, but there is so much more that we can do to address uh, well-being inequalities through heritage. This strategy is internal to Historic England as we are trying to start from within our own organization and see how we can address some of these issues and how we can change things to ensure that we make the most difference where it's most needed. We hope that it will enable us to collect our own evidence, uh, to model good practice and learn from our own experience. Of course, uh, it all sounds great, uh, but how we will do this in practice is a different story. So we decided that none of this will actually work unless we develop a whole organizational approach, meaning that uh, when we ask of our colleagues to change the way they work or approach things in their routine tasks and projects delivery, they do that as part of a system that is also there to support them, to make them feel valued and appreciated, and which embeds well-being in the organizational approach to performance management and personal professional development. We have three key strands of work on which uh, we plan to focus. Our work, uh, so what difference can we make, with the aim uh, being to embed well-being outcomes in our work and seek out opportunities uh, to learn from and collaborate with um, 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 other organizations um, who can also be interested to improve uh, those well-being outcomes. The second is our people. Uh, so what can our staff do? Uh, looking to develop the knowledge and expertise of our people to ensure that they can recognize opportunities and take forward uh, initiatives to achieve uh, positive well-being outcomes. And the third uh, is heritage potential. What can the heritage sector do? Where we share the knowledge we gain uh, with other organizations working in heritage and to challenge them and support them uh, to embed well-being outcomes in, in what they do. Um, it's all in development still. Sorry, my uh, screen is misbehaving, so I'll just take it an inch down. Here we go. Apologies for that. Um, it's all in development still, uh, but we're hoping to launch uh, the Wellbeing and Heritage Strategy in May. Um, and we're already working on our internal learning program, which will offer modules under those two main sub-themes of what is well-being generally, what it means to me as a person and a professional, and then we will go into what well-being means for our delivery and how we can embed well-being in what we already do. Not as an add-on uh, to our existing program, definitely not as another box to tick, uh, but as a different way to do what we already do, how to target the groups that we're engaging um, and how to ensure that our work delivers the biggest positive uh, social impact possible. So if this works, we hope that the approach can be applied anywhere really. And we also don't pretend uh, to have reinvented the wheel. Many of you um, are already uh, doing this um, in one way or another, but we believe that it is specifically important if the government arm length body um, responsible for protecting the historic environment and advising on heritage matters comes up with a statement and an example of embedding well-being organizationally, strategically, 
and operationally. So it will be easier for the entire sector to work together in that way as a result, and will help us all make the case for the well-being benefits of engaging with heritage and archaeology. So as we know, and Jill pointed out a moment ago, uh, the UK is committed to the delivery of the sustainable development goals. Government says that the most effective way to do this is uh, by ensuring that the goals are fully embedded uh, in planned activity of each government department. So following on that, our wellbeing and heritage strategy is hoping to help embed at least a few major ones here, mainly reducing inequalities, especially health inequalities in this case, support sustainable cities and communities, develop partnerships and having good health and well-being. The UK government's response to social inequities so far has been patchy, to say the least, and we know from the most recent Marmot report that the health gap has grown between wealthy and deprived areas even further in the last few years, um, and that improvements to life expectancy have stalled and declined, especially for the poorest, and that place matters a lot in all this, with uh, regional disparities affecting our chances in life, our quality uh, of life and even our life expectancy. So the efforts of strategic and policy tools like the leveling up white paper and the expected health disparities white paper later this year should be maximized, especially by organizations quite central to place-based interventions such as Historic England. Hence our hope uh, and push uh, to lead on embedding well-being in all our strategic programs and objectives. If we, if we manage uh, to push this through on the high strategic level and get well-being embedded in our corporate plan, in our public value framework and objectives as an organization, we can expect this filtering down then to objectives and outputs uh, central to our place-based heritage action zones programs, our heritage at risk and development advice in our partnership approach, our public engagement, our criteria for awarding grants, and the way we evaluate all this work eventually too. So to focus on well-being, we must consider the needs of everyone. By actively working on well-being, we will deliver greater social inclusion and more diverse ways to interact with heritage. We must advocate a people and heritage-led approach. To do so, it's important to listen to people's needs and experiences and learn from others and build shared approaches. There are many ways to do this and we will continue to take the opportunity um, that arises through local partnerships, but we also have established priority areas of concern uh, based on current social needs. We're looking at four key priority areas or audiences as a start, where we feel it will be most beneficial to focus on uh, delivery of well-being through heritage now. These are young young people, older people, mental health and loneliness. We're aware that these are not mutually exclusive groups, neither do they cover every element of health and well-being. Uh, but we believe that this focus will help us to develop knowledge with partners to understand specific needs um, of particular communities. One of the most promising delivery mechanism of embedding well-being and addressing health inequalities is social prescribing approach that the health system is massively investing in at the moment and which many other sectors such as nature, sport, arts are very actively engaging with. We believe that there is a great opportunity for the heritage and archaeology sector to get involved in this space too and uh, to maximize our public value and our contribution to improved uh, public and individual health by engaging uh, with the health and other sectors and um, partnering up on national and local level to connect people to heritage and archaeology while supporting their health and well-being. Historic England has partnered up with uh, the National Academy for Social Prescribing in uh, 2020 and created the role of Historic Environment Lead there, to which I'm seconded uh, on a part-time basis since. And we're working with many of you uh, to raise the awareness of social prescribing in the heritage sector and vice versa and help create these links and partnerships and support the development of innovative social prescribing approaches through heritage work. We need more data and research, of course, um, and we need funding, um, but uh, we need support to build all this for sure. Uh, there is a lot of potential in this work and I hope we will see at least uh, some of it come to fruition soon. Now, new as all this stuff may be, embedding well-being and heritage, piloting, social prescribing, etc., archaeologists, not for the first time, are definitely some of the best uh, first adopters, and they have helped the heritage sector and Historic England and even NASP massively 
in making the case for the well-being benefits of connecting people with the historic environment, with demonstrating the public value of targeting a specific hard to reach or vulnerable groups, in successfully addressing issues like health inequalities and supporting local communities with social prescribing and collating fabulous evidence and data as a result too. We all know about uh, the great work that Operation Nightingale and Breaking Ground Heritage projects have done in the past. Benefits such as increased social connectedness, improved feelings of belonging, purpose, self-discovery and meaning are uh, arguably one of the main elements of the unique value of heritage uh, or some of the unique benefits of heritage interventions for well-being. Some argue that this is uh, a much more complex result mixed with the benefits of just being out there, socializing and uh, doing something useful in a friendly environment. Uh, and we still need research and data to clear this out for sure. But one way or another, I think it's obvious how much we can help and what difference um, we can make as heritage professionals and as people. Um, so I'm very impressed and encouraged by some of the truly original and inspiring work of archaeological colleagues. And I would like to share some of this with you now. Wessex Archaeology, really impressive work on well-being overall, a variety of projects and initiatives that can be used as good examples here, including on social prescribing. But I would like to mention uh, here their work with us on developing a project called Working Title Rejuvenate. This project, I know Linda may have mentioned it before, but I want to give you an update on where we are with this. So this project is looking to pilot the most effective ways to improve the lives of vulnerable young people with a particular view to enhancing life opportunities for those at risk of falling out of the mainstream school system and those at risk of entering the criminal justice system through the implementation of a heritage themed participatory intervention. So the pilots take uh, the form of two collaborative projects one uh, in Wilshire, where, which will work with the young people to build a Mesolithic home there. And the second in Kent, uh, which will work on archaeological excavation and recording, taking between 8 to 12 weeks uh, within a standard school year. They are uh, uniquely developed in partnership with local schools and relevant agencies and uh, heritage and wildlife organizations, making a collaborative venture uh, which can be embedded into local and national infrastructures in the future. A key element of the project will be the involvement of the young people in determining aspects of the project and their response to it. And there is considerable scope for co-creation and creative responses to the project they, they are involved in and their experience of the event um, through things like journaling, map making, photography, film and drawing. Wessex have already produced the feasibility study and they are now testing the Wilshire part of this pilot themselves. And Linda has recently visited both Kent and Wilshire, I think. Uh, to see how these are going and was really impressed by the work and the partnerships that have been created with local schools and the probation services in the localities and by some of the young people responses uh, as well. We sincerely hope to be able very soon to secure the necessary funding so that um, this very exciting project can start. The second example I will mention here is a project developed by uh, the York Archaeological Trust called Archaeology on Prescription. I know some of you may have already heard about it as uh, I specifically try to showcase this uh, innovative work on several occasions uh, through my engagement with NASP and Historic England, but I can't miss the opportunity to highlight that work here as well. Archaeology on Prescription is a project um, that seeks to engage York's uh, citizens um, um, in uh, archaeology. Um, and improve people's health and well-being uh, while fostering new social connections and improving confidence through the building of new skills and knowledge. The project is being piloted on a council-owned site of a former care home. Whilst the project engages people from all over the city, local residents, particularly those who live or have lived in the surrounding warm gate area, specifically being encouraged to get involved to help create the most detailed picture of life in this part of the city uh, from the medieval period to the modern day. The scheme brings together York archaeology and a range of local partners to reach those who will benefit the most. For the first pilot they delivered in the autumn of last year, these included Converge, an educational charity for those with lived experience of mental health based at uh, York's and John's University, and uh, Changing Lives, who work with people recovering from addiction. The user response to this has been overwhelmingly positive. Now they are running the second phase of the project, which involves small partner organizations across the city, in particular those working with younger people, such as Tanko Smart, the Hutt, Sash, and Afghan and Syrian refugees. 
York Archaeological Trust are now working with the National Academy of Social Prescribing, who are helping them in developing their partnership with the health sector. They are keen to ensure that archaeology on prescription goes beyond a short-term intervention, and they are now extending their program to cover year-round activities that can continue through the winter months as well. The National Community Renewal Fund awards York Archaeology a grant for the next stage of archaeology and prescription, which includes uh, embedding a social prescribing link worker and utilizing the project's activities for social prescribing referrals. I'm personally very excited um, to see how this project will progress. It's true that there are a lot of challenges uh, in piloting social prescribing for our sector, and these guys are dealing with some of them already. Uh, but all this is part of finding out what works and what doesn't, what partners need to be engaged in how, and how to shape up the development of an approach which is new anyway and far from fully established. There is a lot that our own archaeological teams at Historic England are doing already, not waiting for us to launch any strategy. Um, through initiatives like our apprenticeships and placements, Historic England archaeological training, and community engagement, including through contributions to the Festival of Archaeology. There is a lot happening on the research front by the likes of Professor Karenta Lewis from University of Lincoln, Professor Joe Sofa from University of Southampton, Dr. Karen Bonnell from Solent University, and Dr. Sadie Watson from MOA. And the result of their work will be priceless to guide us in how better to approach and design our project to maximize our public benefit and the well-being outcomes for people. So from what we have already heard, few things stand out and make it obvious really. What are the critical success factors for working with well-being? This can be, of course, much more complex and multifactored, but ultimately it boils down to three main things, without which we will struggle to effectively deliver well-being to any individual or community and to achieve lasting positive effect with our work. And these things are to embed well-being from the beginning, uh, both well-being objectives and evaluation needs really to be embedded from the very beginning. A crucial first step during project planning is to evaluate the potential of that project or work to improve well-being. And if that estimated potential is not high, it's useful to consider shifting the focus of the project or changing the target group or geographic area in a way that it will increase the potential for well-being delivery. The second is focus on local need and to address health inequalities. To maximize the well-being benefit of our project, it is paramount that we identify both the needs and the priorities of the local areas and the social groups most affected by health inequalities there specifically. This will inform the focus and the choice of potential beneficiaries of the design project and will ensure the biggest social impact. The third is co-production and partnership. All decisions taken during the project and all products created as a result of it ideally should be co-created and co-delivered with a wide range of partners from the health sector, local authorities, the voluntary sector, to local communities, specific groups in need, evaluators, academics, relevant communities of practice. It is very important to identify and approach partners who have expertise and experience in these areas and in working with specific groups in need. Their input will be crucial in order to know what will work uh, for efficient well-being delivery and how we can adapt some of our approaches and methodology in order to maximize the impact of our work. These three principles are at the core of our guidance for delivering social prescribing as well, with the added encouragement specifically for proactively networking with the partners from the health sector and the link workers in this case as well. So I will stop now, uh, but not before. I also mention our partners um, at, at the Council for British Archaeology and more specifically Neil Redfern and Claire Corkio for their massive help and support in the establishment of the Wellbeing and Heritage Working Group, a sector-wide group that we formed with them as of October last year and which is trying to bring together all of us who are interested and active in the field of well-being and heritage and want to learn more, partner up and find the best ways to uh, support each other uh, in making the case for the potential of our sector to deliver well-being for individuals and communities and for making a real difference to people's lives. New and Claire have joined myself and Linda Moncton at Historic England to help bring uh, such a group together and we have already focused our efforts in several main directions through the establishment of task and finish groups looking at definitions and evaluation we started a heritage and social prescribing community of practice and we ran a research gaps workshop 
all of which are now followed up by plans for further engagement, products and focused collaboration, the result of which we hope to share more widely later this year. But by the way, all these groups and forums are open to anyone interested. So if this is you, please feel free to get in touch with myself, Neil or Claire, the more the merrier and uh, the bigger impact and change uh, we can hope for. So with that seller's pitch at the end, um, I would just say a big thank you for your kindness, uh, interest and patience today. Thank you for putting up with me uh, in Linda's absence. And uh, I hope to hear from many of you in the future, if not personally, at least uh, when I read about your fabulous work and uh, share the results of your achievements in uh, making archaeology accessible, reliable, relatable and inclusive for all and making that difference with everything you do. So thank you.